Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on running a successful creative business, business, legal, and tax tips. This is actually the first in a four-part series covering creative businesses, so be sure to tune in over the next three Tuesdays for the remaining webinars in the series. I'm Tim Ryan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'll be your host. Our presenter today is Cliff Enico. More on Cliff in just a minute. Some brief information on SCORE. There's over 320 offices, 11,000 volunteers nationwide. We're the all-volunteer arm of the Small Business Administration. SCORE Fairfield County has over 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary evaluated services to small business owners. One, free one-on-one -on -one counseling, two, educational workshops and webinars, over 150 per year, three, extensive resources on our website, including Word and Excel templates to help you build your business plan. SCORE puts on many webinars each month. Look for future events on our webinar calendar at fairfieldcounty.score.org. Some useful information about today's event. If you have a question, please use the chat window at any time during the presentation. It's located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end at one o'clock to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available on our website within the next couple of days. Now our speaker. Cliff Enico is a nationally recognized authority on legal issues in small business and is best known as the former host of Money Hunt, the PBS television series. His weekly business advice column appears in dozens of major newspapers and small business websites throughout North America. He's a frequent contributor to Entrepreneur and other small business magazines, has hosted over 100 videos on YouTube, and is the author of 16 books on entrepreneurship and career management. Welcome, Cliff. I'll turn it over to you now. Hey, thanks, Tim, and thanks for the excellent introduction. Um, okay, I guess the one thing that all of you should have picked up on in that wonderful introduction that Tim just gave me is the fact that I am a lawyer uh, who is going to tell you a little bit about how to succeed in a creative business. Uh, that seems a little odd at first, but when you look at my background, I'm not just a lawyer. I'm also an author. I've written about 16 books. I just finished number 17, uh, which is going to be published in the fall uh, on nonprofit organizations. Um, I am a weekly syndicated columnist. I am a professional speaker. I speak around the country. So I do have a creative business, despite the L word, uh, which can be somewhat off-putting for people. Uh, those of you who doubt that I am a lawyer, though, here is the disclaimer slide. Uh, which we lawyers always do. We always tell you what we're not going to do uh, before we do anything. Um, the most important one here is the second one. Uh, we are going to be getting into some legal stuff today. I am going to do a little bit of introductory copyright uh, stuff on this program, uh, but there's a very big difference between giving legal information and legal advice. Uh, there's a very big difference between saying, hey, here's what the law is generally all about, which is what we do on these programs. And now here, Mary, is what you should do. And here, Joe, is why you should do something different. And here, Tim, is why you should do something different. That's one-on-one -on -one advice, which I cannot do in a program of this nature. So if you do hear something on this program that sounds like a great idea, and you take advantage of it, and it turns out to be an absolute horror, you end up you know, uh, filing bankruptcy, getting divorced, losing your house, the dog pees in your leg, the kids don't talk to you anymore, you're living in a diaper box under the Brooklyn Bridge. You can't sue anybody, OK? That's basically what this is all about. Um, Today's program is an introduction. Uh, there, as Tim mentioned, this is a four-part series. Today, uh, today's program, we're going to be talking about just some general big picture stuff about running a creative uh, or artistic business, some basic rules of the road. Uh, we are going to touch on some things like copyright and trademark, but we're not going to get into a lot of detail on those. That comes later on in the program. Each program in the series is progressively more detailed. So next week, next Tuesday, you're going to be hearing my very good friend, uh, Randy Spina, uh, whom I've known for many years, and she's going to be talking about how to market uh, the creative business. And this is something she's been working with creative you know, businesses her entire career. Uh, and that is a program you definitely don't want to miss. Then the following week, um, the first uh, Tuesday in August, I am going to be speaking again on copyright. And then the following week after that, I'm concluding the program uh, with a one-hour program on trademark. 
and what you need to know. Those are the, the four basic areas you need to know about when you're running a creative business. But to begin with, I wanna begin with a mystery. I wanna have some fun here a little bit before we begin. Um, I call this the mystery of the missing Mozart cello concerto. Now, you don't have to be a classical music lover to know who Mozart was. He was probably one of the greatest classical composers of all time. He lived in Austria in the latter part of the 1700s. Um, sadly, he only lived to about 35 years of age. Um, but produced, you know, an incredible amount of music, all of which is very good. Um, he, he, he was a master of a form called the concerto. Uh, the concerto was a very popular piece of music in his day. It was basically, uh, it was basically a, a solo instrument and an orchestra that talked to each other uh, throughout the concerto. You know, the orchestra develops a theme and then the soloist takes it further. It goes back to the orchestra and they have a little bit of a tennis match going back and forth. Um, Mozart was a champion concerto writer. Uh, he wrote 27 concertos for the piano forte of his time. Um, he wrote seven concertos for the violin. He wrote a concerto for the oboe. He wrote four concertos for the French horn, which at the time was a very new and novel instrument. It was just being added to the orchestra during his day. Um, you know, and nobody did it better, but here's a mystery. In his entire life, he never wrote a cello concerto, a, chair, a concerto for the cello. And this has surprised a lot of people, musicologists and music scholars and biographers, because we knew, number one, that he knew how to play the cello, was one of the several instruments that he, that he knew how to play. We also know from his surviving correspondence that he loved the cello. He, he thought it was a beautiful instrument. Uh, the instrument that most closely in the orchestra that most closely resembles the human voice in terms of its range and timber. Um, you know, and certainly there were other composers like of that time, like Haydn and Boccherini, who wrote amazing cello concertos. It certainly could be done. So what happened here? Why did Mozart not write a concerto for the cello? Did he just wimp out? Was it just something that he, you know, had a block on, some kind of a mental block that he couldn't do it? Well, Here's the thing. Now, obviously, if this were a live program, I would ask some of you to solicit, you know, your responses. Uh, obviously, in a webinar format, that's very, very hard to do. But the key to answering this, this riddle is if you think about Mozart as a composer, as a musical genius, you will never get the answer. You will never be able to figure out the answer. It's a mystery. Uh, but if you think of Mozart differently, if you think of Mozart as an entrepreneur, as someone who made his living writing music, out of his home office in Vienna, uh, if you will. He worked out of his home, uh, as many of us do, as I do, as you can see the background, the cluttered background in the back. Um, if you think of him that way as an entrepreneur, as a small business person whose business just happened to be writing music, the answer is obvious. The reason why we do not have a Mozart cello concerto is because he couldn't find anyone to pay him to write one. You know, Mozart, you know, was not just a genius sitting in a garret, you know, writing whatever he wanted to write. Uh, he only put, you know, quill to parchment whenever a, no a wealthy nobleman stopped by and paid him a couple of gold coins to write music on demand. Uh, the reason why we have the four French horn concertos is that one of his patrons uh, was a local nobleman in Salzburg whose son was very enamored of the music of the French horn and couldn't find enough challenging music to play because uh, it was a very new instrument at the time. Um, uh, so, so Mozart you know, wrote his four French horn concertos, which are still probably the best music ever written for the French horn, even after 250 some odd years. Um, you know, that's why we have the French horn concertos. Unfortunately, there was no wealthy nobleman in Salzburg or anywhere else that would pay him to write a cello concerto. So that's why we don't have it. That's the lesson for this program. This is not a program about music, uh, classical music. This is a program about how to succeed in business. Mozart was actually a very successful businessman. Uh, you know, we think of him as dying sort of alone in a garret. It was, his death was very tragic. But uh, according to a book that I read a number of years ago, when he died uh, in 1790, I believe it was, he was, he was making the equivalent of about $190,000 a year in today's money. Now that's not 1% by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not poverty uh, either. He was actually doing pretty okay. Uh, as, 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 a, as a business person. Um, let's talk about what, is, what does it mean to say that art is a business? That, that's a concept that I think is anathema to a lot of my creative clients. They think of themselves as artists first. They don't think of themselves as business people. And I think that that hurts them in a lot of ways. Um, you know, all successful artists are very good business people. 
and were a very, if you read their biographies, you will see that they were very good business people. You know, basically, if you create something that doesn't sell, we call it a hobby. Um, you know, the, you may know that the IRS has rules, uh, rules as to whether something is a business or a hobby. And I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but just keep in mind that if you want to claim what you do as a business and take business deductions, the IRS requires that you make a profit sooner or later. You have to show a profit in at least two out of three years running, um, you know, for, for a period of time. If you are consistently losing money at, at something, the IRS says that it's a hobby and they will not let you take business deductions for a hobby. Um, so, so to some extent, you, if you're going to succeed in your business, uh, whether it's, you know, doing art or practicing law, you have to make money at some point. Um, the two of the greatest artists, Van Gogh versus Picasso. If you know the story, um, you know, Van Gogh was, you know, very tragic uh, figure, you know, did some of the greatest, you know, art of the, of the 1800s uh, and basically, you know, committed suicide. He shot himself in a wheat field somewhere in Southern France when he was in his thirties. Now, Picasso, on the other hand, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, lived into a very, very ripe old age uh, and was, you know, one of the wealthiest artists of his time uh, in the world. Um, you know, why did these two genius artists end up differently? You know, well, one ignored his market. I mean, Van Gogh was one of those guys who just lived in a garret and just painted whatever he wanted to paint, you know, in his own way. And it wasn't until well after his death that he was recognized for the genius that he was. The other, Picasso, worshipped his market. He did not do anything that he thought wouldn't sell. He didn't. I mean, you know, now that doesn't take away it for any from any of their genius. It doesn't take away from that. You know, just like, you know, Mozart, I hope you don't mind. But what I said about Mozart a few minutes ago, that doesn't take away from the fact that he was a brilliant composer, you know, but, you know, there is no there is no contradiction between success and and artistic quality and uh, artistic uh, um uh, what, uh, what's the word I'm fishing for? Artistic, I'm reaching that age now where I have to sort of struggle for words. Uh, but are there artistic integrity? There's no, there's no challenge there. Uh, both are famous, but which one would you rather end up as? Would you rather end up as Van Gogh or would you rather end up as Picasso? I think you'd want to end up as Picasso. Uh, the two, the fame and business success are not incompatible. I mean, Shakespeare did pretty well for himself uh, during his lifetime. Uh, he was actually a very popular, he was the most popular playwright of his time. Um, you know, of course, assuming he wrote all the works, which is a, a big debate, um, you know, the great art speaks to the internal, not the transitional, uh, but you will starve if it doesn't sell. The bottom line is, if you're going to make money in anything, it has to sell. Someone has to buy it. it it's, it's a line that you have to draw. If you want to be a truly great artist, you don't want to do works that are ephemeral and that are, that are of its time. Um, uh, I can I can best illustrate this with some examples. Uh, you know, material success does not guarantee lasting fame. You know, I don't know if you remember who Margaret Keane was. Uh, she was the lady in the 60s. She did the, the paintings of all the little kids with the big eyes, the big saucer eyes that bugged out at you. Very popular in, in her day. Obviously, you know, not not much today. You can't, her paintings aren't really worth that much today. You know, they enjoyed a brief period of popularity in the 60s and early 70s, and that was it. Thomas Kincaid, you remember who he was. Uh, he did this paintings of, you know, country cottages, usually, you know, bathed in a very special light. In fact, he actually tried to trademark that. Uh, he, tried, he tried to trademark the look and feel of his paintings so that other artists wouldn't copy him. The trademark office wouldn't give him the time of day, but he did try. Uh, at one time, I remember back in the 80s, he had uh, stores uh, specializing in his art in tourist locations all over the United States. Today, nothing. People barely remember who he was. Leroy Neiman, uh, uh, an artist that was very much influenced by J.M.W. Turner, the English Impressionist. Uh, he did a lot of paintings of sporting events, race cars, tennis matches, golf matches, that kind of stuff. Uh, he was catering to the sports crowd. Again, very popular in the 60s and 70s. Those of us who are boomers on this call will remember who he was. But today, you know, the younger generation don't even know who he is. Um, you know, fame can be very fleeting. Um, what do Bing Crosby, Burl Ives, Andy Williams, and Brenda Lee have in common? Well, they were all singers, obviously. Uh, they were all musicians, but there's something more that unites them. Bing Crosby was probably the biggest star of his day. He was the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, everything all you know, into one. Back in the 1920s and 30s, if you were a crooner, if you were the lead singer 
in a big band, you know, you were famous. Uh, and um, uh, some record company just came out recently with a, a compilation of all his hits. And there are over a thousand songs in that compilation that he recorded from the 1920s to, I guess, the 1960s. Uh, it's that time. But if you know Bing Crosby today, what do you know him for? You know him for only one song. White Christmas, which is played every time at Christmas time, it's done to death, but that's it. Burl Lives, one of the great folk singers of the 1960s, the folk uh, music revolution of the late 1950s and early 1960s. Also a great actor, uh, won, an, won an Academy Award uh, for his uh, presentation of uh, Big Daddy and Pat in the Hot Tin Roof with Elizabeth Taylor in 1960s, right? But, you know, if you know Burl Lives today, what do you know about one song have a holly jolly christmas again a christmas song andy williams one of the greats uh my mother used to love him he had his own tv show on nbc in the 1960s great musician great singer but what's his what's his one claim to fame again a christmas song the one about you know dickory doc you know go up the clock that one i can't even remember the name of it <laughs> that's how bad it is and then brenda lee uh here's a here's a piece of pop trivia name the pop music artist in the 1960s uh, who had the second highest number of hits after the Beatles. Answer, Brenda Lee. Interesting. Like, uh, a name that this time forgot. But what's the one song that everybody remembers her for? Rock Around the Christmas Tree. These were all amazing artists, brilliant artists, very, very popular in their time. But if you know them today, you only know them because of one Christmas song. Only one Christmas song stands between them and total, uh, and total obscurity. That's it. That flame can be fame can be a very fleeting, uh, fleeting thing. The key is genius. It's giving the customer what they want without sacrificing your product quality. Anyone who has ever read one of Stephen King's no novels will tell you he is probably the greatest writer of the baby boom generation in any in any genre. Uh, he creates amazing characters. You care about these people. His novels, you know, despite what he writes about. Uh, you know, are standing the test of time. Back in the 1980s, he had a big competitor named Peter Straub, who also wrote horror fiction, but his fiction was a little bit more fantastic. It was more about the scary monsters and less about human nature. Uh, and his work hasn't stood up to the test of time as much. If you know Peter Straub, you know, you picked him up one of his books at a library book sale somewhere because the library is deaccessioning it. Every one of Stephen King's 70 plus books are in print today, and they will probably be in print 100 years from now. I mean, not not all Mozart is great, but there is no bad Mozart. You know, the fact that Mozart was, you know, made his living, you know, by writing music does not take away from his, his greatness as a composer at all. Uh, you know, the key to success is, to, you know, get, get a commission, get paid for your work, but then throw everything of yourself into that commission um, and, and make it the, uh, the work of art that it truly deserves to be. If you do that, then you stand a chance of being a great artist, even though you are making money. Okay. Okay, there are three. So how do artists make money? There are three ways that they make money. They can make money by performing their art. If you're a musician or an actor in the theater or a playwright, um, you know, you, you make money every time your work is performed or uh, recorded. Um, you know, uh, in music, it's called publishing rights. Every time a work of music is played on the radio or whatever in a show, uh, you know, the uh, the author of the uh, of the music gets a few pennies, uh, something like that. But those pennies add up. Um, you know, especially for music that's been around for a very long time. The estate of Bill Crosby does very well at Christmas time every year, thanks to White Christmas. Thank you very much. Um, they can make their money by selling their art, paintings and photography. They can do gallery exhibits uh, or museum exhibits, or, you know, they can put them up in a, uh, a restaurant or something like that. You've all been to restaurants that have art on the walls that you can buy, uh, you know. Um, actually, I, I know a doctor that does that. He has, he's, a, he's an amateur photographer and he showcases local photographers. He puts up their photographs in his office. Oh, I don't think too many people are going to his office to uh, uh, to, to check out the photography. He's a proctologist, so it's, it's not exactly the image. Um, but um, but here's the big thing. The last way is the most important, and this is what I want to talk about today: is licensing their copyright and collecting royalties. This is the last way. The last way here is the key to long-standing success because it provides a steady cash flow over the long term. If you, if you, um, 
you know, if you paint a painting and you sell it, you know, at a craft fair or something like that, you make money from the sale of the painting, but that's it. You don't make any money after that, after the painting is sold. You got to paint another one and sell it to make money. Okay. Whereas if you, if you keep the copyright and you make copies of that painting, lithographs, serigraphs, whatever they call them, you can make money in perpetuity, even on a work that you have sold. Okay, already, you can still make money on works of art that you have sold already by keeping the copyright and making reproductions of them, uh, or NFTs. We'll talk about NFTs a little bit later in the program. Okay, here's a trivia question. What is the highest grossing American stage play, non-musical? I have to be very clear about that, non-musical, uh, dramatic play. What is the highest grossing American stage play of all time? Now, that's a tricky question. What are you thinking? You know. Okay, so I mentioned Cat in the Hot Tin Roof, uh, any of the works of uh, Arthur Miller or, you know, uh, Death of a Salesman or something like that? The answer is no. The highest grossing American stage play of all time is a play that you know, but you're not thinking about it. I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit about it. It ran on Broadway, but it only ran on Broadway for two weeks. Uh, it folded after only two weeks, even though it featured one of the major Hollywood actors of his of that time in uh, a starring role. I will tell you, I'll even tantalize you further. The play was on Broadway in the 1930s, okay? Um, you know, so what is this play? What is the highest grossing? I'm not, I don't care about how popular it is or whether you learned about it in high school. What is the highest grossing? What was the biggest money-making American dramatic play of the 20th century? The answer, okay? And if I, I'll even taint you, I'll even uh, taint you, uh, um, uh, I mean, I'll, I, I can, in fact, I don't even, I'm having trouble now remembering even who the author of the play was. It, no, I remember it. Okay, the playwright was Joseph Kesselring, a one-hit wonder. This was one of the only plays he wrote uh, in his entire life. It was on Broadway, featured a uh, top-grossing Hollywood actor, only lasted for two weeks, and yet it's the highest-grossing American stage play. The play? You're going to hate yourself when I tell you. You probably, if you were in a high school drama club, you probably acted in it at some point. Arsenic and old lace. The old ladies who kill the old people and they bury them in the basement, right? One of the funniest plays that's ever been written, by the way, and it still holds up even after almost 100 years now. It was uh, first came out in the 1930s. Uh, the Hollywood actor, by the way, who appeared in the play on Broadway was Boris Karloff, who then was at the height of his fame uh, with Frankenstein. Uh, he was he played the role of uh, Jonathan, the crazy brother who escapes from the mental institution. Um, you know, again, it, 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 again, this was a play that only lasted for two weeks, but because of all the repertory work, theater that, I mean, just about every theater company in the America has done Arsenic and Old Lace. It is the highest grossing American stage play of all time. The key to success, if you, if you come away with anything, with nothing else from this program, this is the way what I want you to come up, come away with. The key to success for any creative business any artistic business is to control and exploit the intellectual property rights to the artworks rather than the works themselves. And you can quote me, you, you know, if, if all you're doing is making money from selling your work, well, you're making some money, but by keeping the copyrights and keeping control of those copyrights and controlling the flow of authorized reproductions of your work, you stand a much greater chance of getting rich. Uh, and succeeding in your business. It's all success in a creative business is all about the copyrights, the intellectual property rights, not the works themselves. That's the big lesson I want you guys to come away with today. Uh, successful artists tailor their art to what the customers want, creating only what sells, knowing the market and what it really wants, not what it says it wants. Very often the market lies to you. That's one of the dirty lessons you learn in any small business, I think, not just creative businesses, but it really applies here. People will say, oh, we want more serious music. We want more intellectually challenging music. Baloney. Uh, what they want is more George Gershwin. What they want is more Beatles. What they want is more Rolling, Rolling Stones. I mean, you will never make money. Uh, if you own a concert venue, you will never make money on an Arnold Schoenberg. Uh, he was, the, he was the, the guy that uh, created 12-tone serialism. Uh, back in the 1930s. Uh, I mean, what can I say? Mathematically, the mu it's very interesting music, but you cannot listen to it for more than five or 10 minutes without getting a headache. It's very dissonant. It's atonal. 
music, basically. Whereas George Gershwin based his music on jazz. Okay, George Gershwin Festival, you'll get crowds of people. Every 4th of July, there's a George Gershwin uh, Festival going on somewhere. People sitting on lawns, eating picnic food and listening to George Gershwin. Don't try this with Arnold Schoenberg. No one will show up. Um, build a recognizable brand image to build repeat sales. If each work of art is a completely unique thing, it's kind of hard to build a brand. Your works of art, whatever they are, should look or sound the same in a certain way so that people will identify it. When I go into a jewelry store, I can spot a David Yurman piece a mile away. Uh, he has a very distinctive look and feel uh, to his jewelry. You know, and it doesn't take away from the fact that it's very good and very expensive. Um, you know, um, you want to you want people to be able to recognize, oh, that's a Cliff Anico. That's Cliff Anico's style. You want people to do that because that helps you build repeat sales. You know, people buy every time Stephen King sells a new book, all of his back catalog in, uh, has a spike in sales. Uh, all of the 70 other books that he has written. That's what you want, where each new work that you generate creates that kind of, uh, of a back, we actually call that a uh, backlog, of, uh, a, a back catalog effect uh, in the publishing world. Control the intellectual property rights to all of your work. These are the keys to success here. Uh, you know, how did the Beatles catalog end up in Michael Jackson's estate? Okay, the answer is because the Beatles' first manager uh, turned out not to be a very good business person. He loved the music. He loved the Beatles. They were very close to him. Um, but he that he didn't um, he wasn't a very good businessman. He he basically put all of the copyrights to the early Beatles songs, the pre-1966 stuff, into a trust, and he lost control of the trust. So the Beatles lost control of their own music and their own copyrights. And that is how it went through a succession of owners. It ended up Michael Jackson uh, back in the 80s, you know, bid at auction. Um, and it was only when he died that Paul McCartney, Sir Paul McCartney, paid, we do not know exactly how much he paid. It was a private sale, but it was probably somewhere between three and $500 million to get the copyrights back to the music that he and John Lennon wrote in the early 1960s. That is a disaster. Um, right up until a couple of years ago, there were over 200 people involved in court cases over the right to a single three minute song. The three minute song that was a doo wop song from the 1950s called Why Do Fools Fall in Love by Frankie Lyman. Uh, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers it was their biggest hit, one of their only hits. Um, well, Frankie Lyman had a very interesting love life. He had several wives, uh, some at the same time. Uh, he had a, an incredible number of lovers in his life. And whenever he got romantically involved in someone, he gave them the rights to Why Do Fools Fall in Love? So when he died, you know, somewhat tragically, I think, they made a movie out of this, by the way, with Haley Berry sometime back in the 90s, uh, if you're interested. But when he died uh, sometime in, I guess, the late 80s or early 90s, over 200 people, you know, showed up in court claiming an interest in this three minute piece of music. And they all had a document signed by Frankie Lyman saying that they owned it. And it took 20 years for this to be resolved in the courts. What they finally did was they created a trust with all of these people as beneficiaries. And so whenever you hear why do fools fall in love with the local shop, right? You know, those royalties, those few pennies are being split between 200 some odd people uh, who are claimants. That's what happens when you lose control of your copyright, and it's not a good thing. So let's talk about copyrights. We're at that point now. What is a copyright? What is a copyright? Well, the best way to do it is to visual. I, I, I'm a very visual thinker, despite being a lawyer. Um, so here's what I want you to do. I want you all, we're gonna do something a little California right now. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to picture in your mind a work of art. Let's say it's the Mona Lisa, okay? Everybody knows what the Mona Lisa looks like, okay? Uh, picture, a, it, this works, with, with other types of art as well, but it works best with paintings, okay? Let's say that you have the Mona Lisa sitting on a table, the original Mona Lisa, okay? You're looking at it now. Now in your mind's eye, about two feet above the painting, project a hologram, a three-dimensional thing that looks exactly like the Mona Lisa down to the last brush, brush stroke, but it's a hologram. It's sitting in the air, it's hovering in the air above the painting itself. And the, the, the hologram looks exactly like the painting down to the last brush strokes, down to the last, you know, micro blob of paint. But it's, it's three, it's, it doesn't have any substance. You can put your hand through it. You can, you know, it's, it's, it's immaterial. It floats in the air. 
Okay, it is three dimensional, but it's, it's, it doesn't really exist in the physical world. Now, in your mind's eye, take the painting away off the table, but leave the hologram floating in the air. Okay, you now have a nice little visual. You can open your eyes, by the way. I, I don't, I, I worry that my audience is going to fall asleep uh, here if you do this. Um, but you have a very good visualization of what a copyright is. Whenever you create a work of art of any kind, you're not just creating the work of art itself that sits on the table, you're also creating that hologram that looks exactly the same. And that hologram is the copyright. Okay. And the reason why I told you to take it off the take the painting off the table was to illustrate the point that the copyright does has nothing to do with who owns the underlying work of art. You can sell a painting to somebody for good money, but you but unless you specifically grant them the copyright, you keep the copyright. And that's important. And those copyrights become very valuable, especially as you get uh, more popular, more famous. Uh, those copyrights have a lot more value sometimes than the, than the actual works of art. Uh, copyright has nothing to do with ownership. A lot of people think, oh, if you have the copyright to a work of art, you own it. That is not legally true. Uh, it really, it's more like a legal monopoly. Um, we all know that monopolies are not a good thing in, in, in America. You know, we believe in competition. There's a whole body of law called the antitrust laws that are designed to preserve competition. If a company gets too big and starts taking over too many markets and gets too much market power, the antitrust laws require that the company being broken up. Uh, there's a lot of controversy right now. Some of the big tech companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, there are some people who think that they should be broken up because they've just gotten too big and they're too influential. I don't know where you stand on that, but antitrust law is kind of making a comeback right now. It has been kind of dormant for the last 30 or 40 years but because of the big tech giants uh, starting to make a comeback. But a copyright is a legal monopoly. It's a monopoly that the government gives you. Okay, uh, it is basically the legal right to exclude others from profiting from a creative work for a period of time. So for a period of X years, if you are the creator of this painting, only you can make money from reproductions of that painting for a certain period of time. And the period of time varies depending upon the type of work that you have created. After that period of time is over, the monopoly is over and other people can make copies of the work. OK, uh, it's basically the right to make copies. It's one of the it's one of the few times in law where the name actually means what it says. A copyright is nothing more than the right to make copies and to publish the work for general consumption. That's what a copyright is. It's not ownership. OK, remember, I said before, you can sell the painting. So somebody else owns the painting. But if you own the copyright, only you have the right to exploit that. Uh, and make reproductions. If the owner of the painting tries to make copies, you can shut them down and sue them for what's called copyright infringement and make them stop because they do not have the copyright of the work. They own it. They can put it up in front over their fireplace. They can burn it if they want to, but you still own the copyright. In fact, there are a lot of copyrights to works that no longer exist. Uh, a lot of the artwork uh, that was destroyed by the Nazis in World War II, uh, those copyrights are still very viable. Uh, and a lot of uh, the artists' estates are making a lot of money off of them. OK, what does copyright protect? Now, we're going to, again, in two weeks time, we're going to do a much more thorough program on copyright. So I'm going to cover the basics here. It covers original works of authorship, literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works, uh, computer software, the code, uh, the lines of code are covered by copyright. Uh, since 1990 architecture, uh, you, can, you can copyright a building design. So no one can do a museum exactly like uh, Frank Gehry's museum in Bilbao, Spain. That design has been copyrighted in the U US and also in Europe. Uh, as well. You know, you can certainly, you know, be inspired by it, but you can't do exactly the same thing that Frank Gehry did uh, in the Bilbao Museum without, uh, you know, without a lawsuit. Uh, what it does not protect, it does not protect ideas. So if I want to go out and I want to create a series of novels based on a young boy who discovers he's a wizard, he's got magical powers, and he goes to this wizarding school where he meets all kinds of other wizards and stuff like that, as long as I don't make the characters look too much like the Harry Potter characters, I can do that. I'm absolutely free to do that. You cannot protect the idea 
uh, behind the copyright. You can all you can protect is the way it is expressed in writing. In fact, I, I'll share with you. Somebody has actually done this. Uh, his name is Lev Grossman. He wrote a series of books uh, over the last decade uh, called The Magicians. In fact, they just made a movie out of the first one a couple of years ago. This is Harry Potter for grown-ups. A young boy discovers he's a wizard, but he discovers it during his teenage years. So he goes to a university of wizards you know, a much different level. Basically, his novels, Lev Grossman's novels are Harry Potter with sex. That's basically what his novels are. And he's perfectly, the, the estate of J.K. Rowling has not done anything about it because they can't, because he's very careful to make his characters distinctive uh, enough that he doesn't have to worry about, you know, the Harry Potter author, J.K. Rowling coming after him. Okay, uh, copyrights versus trademarks. Again, we're going to talk more about this in the, later on in the, in the series. Copyright protects works of authorship, uh, the arrangement of words on a page, the arrangements of notes on a page. Trademark protects marks. These are brand images that are used in commerce, which may be works of art. The McDonald's Golden Arches are a trademark. Uh, the Pillsbury Doughboy, the little fat sucker there, uh, he is you know, a trademark. Uh, he or she, you can't tell. Um, a trademark protects marks that are used to identify goods in the stream of commerce. Uh, and it can be a work of art. It can be a logo, a design. When we talk about trademarks, we're going to talk a lot about logos and designs and, and how those can be trademarkable and should they be trademarkable. Um, so, for example, the author of a graphic novel, a comic book, uh, can copyright the text and graphics. And if a character becomes copy very popular, they may be able to trademark a recurring character. So, for example, Mickey Mouse is a registered trademark of the Walt Disney Company. And man, you do not mess with the mouse ever. Uh, if you, we'll talk more about this when we do trademarks. If you're doing you know, animated characters and you're using animals, you do not want your mouse to look anything even close to Mickey. These people are brutal, they will sue. Okay, there, there, there are some people in the trademark world you do not mess with, and Disney is one of them. Uh, they're, they're nice little cute, cuddly characters, you know, but if you, but if you cross them, baby, you, you see the dark side of Disney. Um, you may be able to trademark an artist's look and feel. Remember Thomas Kincaid tried to do that back in the 80s, but it will be an uphill battle with the trademark office. The trademark office does not like granting trademarks over things that are very vague and general. They, want, they will only trademark something that is very, very specific. Again, we'll talk more about this in the last thing a less program what does copyright give you it gives you a number of number of rights it gives you the exclusive right to publish and make copies of the work the exclusive right to profit from the work in any derivative works we're going to talk a lot when we talk about copy when we do the copyright program in two weeks from today today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about a derivative work and what that is the exclusive right to edit alter or change the work and the exclusive right to sue others who infringe your copyright so if the owner of the painting your painting tries to copyright it and do seriographs and reproductions, you have the absolute right to shut them down unless you sold them the copyright as well, which would be a very, very stupid to do. Okay, how do you profit from copyright? There are two ways you can profit from copyright. You can either sell or assign it. Selling and assigning mean the same thing or license the copyright. Licensing the copyright is like leasing the copyright. It's the better way to go. When you sell or assign a copyright, you no longer own it. Now, if you write the great American novel and you wanna have it published by Simon & Schuster or Harper, Harper Collins or any of those people, uh, the publisher is going to want you to assign the copyright to them. As long as they are publishing the book, they want to own the copyright and control the copyright. And you don't mind that so much because they are gonna take on all the risk of publishing the book, making sure the book sells, getting it into the Barnes and Nobles and Amazons and all that stuff. And they're going to make you rich. So you don't mind giving them the copyright. The only thing that I do, though, when I do book contracts, I always make sure that if the book isn't selling at all, if it's reached the point where, you know, they're only selling like one or two copies a year, that the copyright reverts to me, that I have the right to write them a letter and say, okay, the book's obviously not, you're not, you're not doing anything with it. I want the copyright back so that I can do, I'm actually doing this now with one of my books. Uh, one of my books got sold to another publisher and the new publisher is not that excited about it. So I'm fighting right now to get my copyright back uh, so that I can, you know, update it and publish it with somebody else. Uh, you always want to have the right to get the copyright back if the 
publisher is not doing their job. Um, be careful when you post your art on social media. Most social media sites, including Facebook, uh, have a little clause in their terms and conditions that says that if you put your work up on Facebook or, you know, or um, Instagram or any of these, they own the copyright. They, you have assigned your copyright to them. Now, they, they're not looking to steal it from you. Uh, they, their intent is much more benign. What they want to do is if, I'm just going to use Facebook as an example. If, if they want to do a book called The 100 Greatest Facebook Posts of All Time, and they want to include your Facebook post as one of the 100, they do not have to come back and pay royalties to you. They want to just be able to do it, okay, without any obligation to the author. Uh, there's some controversy right now about Facebook being able to do that. Uh, by the way, there's some court cases. We're not going to go into that. We'll talk about those more in two weeks. But there's some confusion about this. Keep So when you create a new work of art, do not put it up on Facebook or Instagram. Put it up on your website and put a link to it on Facebook and Instagram. Keep control of that copyright because when you post on Facebook, you may be giving away rights to Facebook that you don't want them to have. Okay, artist contracts. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, when you when you uh, when you when you have your work of art uh, uh, sold in a gallery, you consign the work to them. Um, they do not own the copyright. They only have the right to sell the work, but they they do have the right to sell the work at the price that you specify. Um, it, it's a very special, consignments are a very special type of legal arrangement. You're basically, I, I only have the possession of your artwork, but I have the right to sell it in your name. And we have an agreement, of course, that I get a commission and you get the rest. Um, you should dictate the terms of sale. N you know, never ever give a gallery uh, your copyright. Also make sure that the gallery has insurance. There are a lot of mom and pop galleries in Manhattan, Soho and elsewhere uh, that don't have adequate insurance. If there's a fire and the paintings all get burned up, uh, you may be, you may be stand, st withstanding the loss. Um, be very careful. There are warehouses that specialize in artwork uh, and their contracts are very complex. I've actually negotiated several of these for my artist clients. Make sure that uh, anybody that you give your artwork to for sale has adequate insurance uh, against fire, theft, and all that kind of stuff. Um, book contracts with publishers must assign the copyright. You, you cannot get away without that. They publisher will want it, uh, but the right should revert to you if sales fall below below a certain media. And consider, don't give them rights in all media. You know, there are all kinds of new media being created now, and like, like the NFT, for example, and maybe you want um, you know, uh, to, to, to give the, the rights, the NFT rights to somebody else without giving it to your book publisher. Uh, that's a conversation we'll have more in a couple of weeks. Dealing with taxes. Uh, make sure you are a business, not a hobby. Uh, the good news is you can deduct losses from a hobby, but you can only deduct them against hobby income. Uh, that is not a very exciting proposition. If you have a business loss, if you have a business and you lose money, um, you must, you can deduct that against all your other income, your income from your day job, uh, for example, you know, so, I mean, if I, um, you know, if I, if, if I lose money, you know, in a, in an unrelated business venture, I can deduct that loss against my law firm income. But if it's a hobby, I can't, I can only deduct that, uh, from a, from income from the same, uh, or a different hobby. Don't get me wrong. If you have a hobby and you make money at it, you know, if I have a, you know, a stamp collection or something and I sell it for a profit, the IRS wants, you know, it me, will tax the ink, the, the, the gain that I had, the capital gain on the sale of the stamp collection. But if you lose money, there's a very big difference between having a hobby and varying it and having a business. Business losses are much more valuable than hobby losses. You should always be an independent contractor. Whenever you do work for somebody, you know, artwork for somebody else, uh, try not to sign a work made for hire clause when you are doing work for the customer, because what you're doing there is you're assigning your copyright to the person that you are working for. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're an employee, if you work for a company where doing artwork and graphics as part of your job description, any work that you create will automatically by law uh, be considered a work made for hire, meaning that your employer owns the copyright. Uh, that follows. But if you're an independent contractor, 
uh, if you're say an art consultant uh, and you're doing work on a contract basis, that is not the case. Uh, you are deemed legally to own the copyright unless you formally assign it to your customer. So try to avoid doing that. There's a famous Supreme Court case from 1989 called uh, Community for Creative Nonviolence versus Reed. Uh, for those of you who are trivia buffs, it was um, Thurgood Marshall's last opinion for the Supreme Court before he left the court in 1990. Uh, basically, Reed was a sculptor. He created a bronze sculpture for an organization in Washington, DC uh, that was uh, promoting the interests of homeless people around the country. And this statue was going to be in their main lobby when people walked into the offices in Washington, this is what they would see. He did the sculpture, he got paid for it, they, they installed the sculpture, and the sculpture wasn't that popular. Uh, some people thought it was really ugly. So they went back to the sculptor and said, look, we just want a few tweaks to the sculpture. Um, you know, we, you know, we'll pay you for them, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to do that. But the sculptor said, no, that was my artistic vision, I'm not changing it. Uh, you know, you're, you're making it into something else, you cannot change my work. Well, they thought because they owned the sculpture that they had the right to make the changes on their own. So they went to another sculptor who made the changes and the original sculptor, Mr. Reed, sued for copyright infringement saying that while they owned the sculpture, they did not own the copyright to it. Now that went all the way to the Supreme Court and Thurgood Marshall in his last opinion said, sided with Mr. Reed. He said that was right. The organization did not have the copyright. They did not have the right to make changes. They could sell the work. They could put it in the basement, whatever. Uh, they could even burn it or melt it down and make you know something out of it. But they didn't have the right to make changes to it. That violated Mr. Reed's copyright, even though he got paid for it because he did not assign the copyright. They didn't own the copyright to the work. Um, as far as deductions go, uh, learn what you can deduct and what you can't. This is a very nice website by the way, it's called freelance taxation. It basically is an alphabetical listing of all the things you can deduct when you're an artist. So if you're if you're a you know an, if you're a painter, you know paint is under P. Easel is under E. I mean it's that simple. I love this site because it's not meant for lawyers. It's meant for normal people like you. Uh, you know you can just look. So can I deduct um, you know the cost if I have to travel to an art conference? Can I? Travel is under T. It, uh, it, it tells you exactly what the rules are in layman's English. I love this site, you know, bookmark it uh, when the program is over. Um, in the 2017 tax law, there's a new 20% deduction on qualifying business income. The short answer to this question is you can take the 20% deduction if you qualify as a business. Talk to your accountant. Okay. Uh, how do you keep lawsuits at bay? Now, we've been talking all along about getting a copyright, but what about if you're doing a, a work of art and you copy somebody else? Well, if you infringe somebody else's copyright, you will be sued. So don't steal someone else's stuff. Uh, there are very specific copyright rules for things like mashups, fan fiction, and parodies. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this two weeks from now. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today, but just be aware that if you are doing work that is based on somebody else's work, it has to stand on its own right. It has to be transformative. That's the legal word. It has to be sufficiently different from the main work that it can stand on its own two feet as a work of art. And that's a very difficult decision that courts sometimes have to make if two works of art are similar. Try to avoid basing characters on real life figures, especially rich ones who can afford to sue. Okay, I mean, if you're going to copy some, uh, first of all, if you ever read any novel at all, there's always a little disclaimer in the front of the book that says, um, you know, uh, this, this is an original work of fiction, any resemblance to persons living, living or dead is strictly coincidental. Make sure that disclaimer is in all of your works. You know, if you are basing your work of art on a real person, be very careful about how that person might react uh, if they don't like their depiction. Just mean, just because you know they're not likely to win doesn't mean that they're not likely to sue. Be very careful, and not even real life figures. Be very careful that if you're doing any kind of characters, that they not resemble too much characters in other people's works. I mean, you know, if you're going to do that book about the wizarding kid, don't make him look too much like Harry Potter. Give him a different set of, him or her, a different set of experiences uh, that will make the work stand on its own, like Lev Grossman did with his magician's books. Okay, so we're basically at the end of the program. I, I have a couple of minutes here. So let me, I want to talk about these two cases, actually. These were actual cases uh, that the Second Circuit in New York City, the uh, Federal Appeals Court decided in the very early 
2000s, and they were within six months of each other. Uh, the first case was a, a, a young lady who wrote a book which was based on Gone with the Wind uh, by Margaret Mitchell, but she wrote it, it's basically the same story as Gone with the Wind, but it was told from the perspective of a slave on the Tara plantation, not one of the slaves that was in the original book, not the one that Butterfly McQueen play, played in the movie, uh, but but, but a, 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 a random slave that was not mentioned in the original book, and it was her vision, her perspective on the events of Gone with the Wind, and she actually called it the Wind Done Gone. Okay, so there was definitely an homage to Gone with the Wind. Well, the estate of Margaret Mitchell didn't like this. They sued. Uh, it went to the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit sided with the author. Uh, she, they said that the work was sufficiently transformative. They didn't use any of the original, well, some of the characters were the same in the two books. So, so for example, there was Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara, but they didn't take any of the dialogue from the original book, and none of the scenes were exactly the same. The work was sufficiently different from Gone with the Wind that the Second Circuit felt it could stand on its own as an independent work, a transformative work of art. Now, about six months later, they had this second case. Um, I don't know if you remember who Holden Caulfield was. He was the main character in Catcher in the Rye. Okay, I don't know about you, but reading Catcher, those of us who are baby boomers, reading Catcher in the Rye was one of the most tormenting experiences that our high school English teachers made us do. Okay, this was one of those works like there was was Catcher in the Rye and Gone with the Wind that you almost always had to read. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Catcher in the Rye and uh, Death of a Salesman were the two works that you almost always had to read in your senior year of high school. And I don't know about you, there are some people who love this book, but I hated Catcher in the Rye. I hated Holden Caulfield. I thought he was the biggest snot who had ever lived. You know, and I mean, I had no sympathy with this character. You know, frankly, he deserved everything that happens to him in the book. He deserves. He's just a depressed, neurotic nobody. Okay, uh, forgive me. I, I I hate this book. Okay, this is editorializing. Some of you may love it. Okay, but there are a lot of people who have fond memories of it. And an author in Sweden uh, decided that it would be really cool to write a book about what was Holden Caulfield like when he grew up. What happened to him when he became a baby boom geezer? So he wrote a book, and I don't remember what the title of the book was. I just call it Baby Boom Geezer. It's basically Holden Caulfield in his 60s, you know, living in Manhattan, and he's had this incredible life and whatever. But the author was not as careful as the author of The Wind on Gone. He actually included a lot of Holden Caulfield's personal traits. He copied the character down to the, to, to, to the, to the last detail. He used the exact same name. He also used some of his trademark expressions. So for example, Holden Caulfield is always calling people phonies, uh, everybody but him, of course, and he's the biggest phony of them all. Um, you know, So it, it, he copied all of that. I mean, he did a very faithful job. Well. Uh, the estate of um, J.D. Salinger did not like this. Uh, they brought it. They brought suit against this author, and it went to the Second Circuit only a few months after *The Wind on Gone*. But because the Swedish author's book tracked. Holden Caulfield's character so precisely, the Second Circuit actually said that this wasn't a transformative work. This was a derivative work of Catcher in the Rye. And therefore, all the they did something very interesting. They didn't say the, that the royalties belonged to J.D. Salinger's estate. What they did was they shut down publication. They banned the sale of this book in the United States. One of the most liberal courts in the United States, the Second Circuit in Manhattan, basically enjoined, uh, allowed the estate to get an injunction banning the publication of this book in the United States and Canada. Uh, because it was it was a direct copy it infringed uh, the um, uh, the catcher in the rye book now these cases were decided within six months of each other okay it just shows you that the whole issue of whether a copycat work is transformative or not is a very very subjective one it all depends on the facts and circumstances so that's all I have to say today uh, these are the key points again this is an introductory program so we're just looking at things from 5,000 feet up. My key points are great art and business success are not incompatible. Uh, all of the world's greatest artists were also very good at business, almost all of them. 
Uh, give your customers what they want and create only what sells. Build a recognizable brand image. Keep control of your copyrights at all costs and don't steal other people's stuff or base characters on real life people unless you absolutely have to and you have a very good lawyer who vets your manuscript and will help you avoid getting into the kinds of situations that those Second Circuit cases were all about. And that's all I have to say. This is who I am. We have a couple of questions in the chat room. I'll begin with those. Um, and then um, I think I'm looking at here. Okay, all of the questions. We don't really have any questions. It's mostly about the audio, um, you know, which is choppy. Well, uh, I can't yeah, really we do think about few, that. Yeah, we do have a few questions in the Q and A section. Uh, the first one is: Is it possible to copyright content on a website? Uh, the answer is yes. You should definitely put a little copyright thing at the very bottom of your um, of your slide. Um, in fact. You see that little copyright, that little sucker right down there at the bottom of my slide here? That is how it has to appear. Uh, copyright, the year that you set up the, live, the, um, the website to, uh, to today, um, you always want to do that, by the way, and I'll tell you why in two weeks, um, by Clifford R. Enico, All Rights Reserved. That's called the statutory copyright notice. That should appear at the very bottom of every web page uh, that you do. So the short answer is yes. Um, next question. Yeah, Gigi uh, is saying that the art galleries post photos of my work on Instagram and Facebook all the time. How does that impact my copyright? Okay, you really ought to talk to that gallery uh, because if you look at Instagram's terms of service, they do have language in there saying that whatever you post up there, they have certain rights to that. Um, and you want to make sure the gallery knows and understands that. Now, the gallery is doing what it has to do to promote your artwork, but what they may be doing is they may, and, and the question you really want to ask them is, are they watermarking the photos or are they doing anything to them to prevent the photos being unlawfully copied from Instagram? Because uh, I've made copies of things from Instagram. Um, you know, just, you know, for my own use, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, doing it to make money or anything like that. Um, I, I, I want to use them first because I want to study them for some reason. Um, but I, I you know, I, I find that it's very easy to do. Uh, so, you know, you may be allowing people to make unauthorized copies of your work without consent. Uh, and that could be an issue. Like I said before, my strong preference is not to put the work of art on Instagram itself but have a link to your website or to the gallery's website or someplace where it's under your rules and not under Instagram's rules. That's, that's the goal. We're going to talk a lot more about that in two weeks time. Okay. Lynn wants to know, are certificates of authenticity worth it? And can you create your own? Uh, the short answer is yes, they can be if it comes from a reliable source. Uh, so, for example, a very good friend of mine, a guy named Jim Northrup, uh, he is a leading scholar of 1960s rock posters. You know, the, you know, the, the flying eyeball, Jimi Hendrix, all the psychedelic stuff from the late 60s, the, uh, the uh, Bill Graham posters from the Fillmore in San Francisco. He is a leading authority on this. He is somebody who can tell you if your Ringo Starr autograph is, is, is real or not. That was his trade. He was uh, with Christie's, I think, for many years as an autograph specialist uh, was his thing. And, you know, a certificate of authenticity from him. If you have a genuine Woodstock poster, or you think you do, and you have a certificate of authenticity from him, that is worth something. You know, a certificate of authenticity from Cliff Enico. I mean, I love I love the art of the 1960s, but I'm just a fanboy. I I'm not an expert. It, it really doesn't mean anything. That's what the NFTs are all about. We're going to talk to them about them in a couple of weeks. NFTs are not copyrights. Uh, the non fungible tokens uh, that you've been reading about so much for digital artworks. Uh, these are really certificates of authenticity. Is really what they are. And I'm going to give you my my thoughts on those in two weeks. Um, but that could be uh, a, a good way to create. I mean, when you're doing digital artwork, how do you tell what's the original and what's a copy? That's where the NFT comes in. A work of art that is digital is accompanied by an NFT says that this is an original. It is not a reproduction, it's not a copy, uh, whatever. Again, this gets very complicated. We're still struggling as lawyers with what the NFTs are all about. Uh, these have only come to light in the last six months. Uh, and it takes lawyers a lot to, it takes lawyers a lot longer than that just to go to the bathroom. But especially when new technology comes out, uh, we tend to lag behind the market a little bit. We'll talk about those in two weeks. Okay. Yeah. And Sean wants to know, uh, if you work for a corporation that requires signing a broad copyright acknowledgement for hire 
and you later do artwork that is unrelated to your job, have you signed over your art copyright also? Ah, uh, a very good question. Uh, question number one, when you say later on, are you still employed by the company? If you are no longer employed by the company and you're doing artwork on your own, then that would probably not be subject to the contract that you signed because it was, it was not done with, within the scope of your employment. Uh, California has a lovely statute, by the way. I'm not usually a big fan of California law, but they have a beautiful statute that's very clear on this point. Uh, and I realize you're not in California, but it's a good thing it basically says that in California, um, any a, an assignment of rights clause in a contract, that's what we call it, or assignment of inventions clause, uh, cannot apply to any work that was not created either using on the company's time or using the company's resources. So if you are working for a company and you are creating work, works of art as part of your job, okay, and you want to do stuff on the side, uh, here are the three rules. Never use your company's email address or any your company laptop, anything that the company has ever provided you. Don't use their resources. Number one. Number two, make sure you always do it on your own time. And number three, make sure that it has as little to do as possible with the, 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 with the, the market that you are creating that art for. So if you're, if you're creating, you know, um, you know, web content, you know, or social media content for a company that's designed to uh, generate interest within a certain type of consumer, don't direct your artwork toward that class of consumer. Uh, because then the company can come back and say, well, you really should have done this for us because uh, this would have benefited us. Do it, make sure that it's totally different. You know, so if you're doing web content over here, if you want to do a graphic novel about a superhero over there, that's going to be much safer. Those are the three rules when you're, when you're working for somebody else. Jenny just had a quick question. Uh, she's wondering if it's redundant to put the, use the symbol, the C in the circle, as well as saying copyright spelled oh. out. Is that duplication? You is could that do, yeah. The answer is you, it's either or. You can either use the C in a circle or you can use the word copyright written out. Either one. It is redundant to use both, although there's no harm in redundancy. A, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of, my, of a little mind as uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said. If, if you have trouble with the copyright symbol, by the way, uh, if, you, if you're using Microsoft Word, if you go insert symbol, Okay, and then click on the symbol. It lists the whole bunch of symbols and the copyright symbol is there. So you can just cut and paste it into your text. It's Microsoft Word makes it very easy. If you're using another word processing program, I'm sure there's a similar way you can do it. Okay, thanks. I think that's all the time we have uh, for questions at this time. As a reminder, the recording of this webinar is available within a couple of days on the fairfieldcounty.score.org website. Please check out our website for information on upcoming webinars. Again, SCORE offers free individual counseling, so please use the link on the screen or visit our website and click Request a Mentor. We are available for sessions via phone, email, and video at this time. Also, please fill out your evaluations that have been sent at the end of the webinar. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's SCORE live webinar. In closing today, a big thanks to Cliff Inico. Thanks, Cliff. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. I've been doing these programs now for 40 years, and it's always a pleasure to do work for the SCORE organization.